from all over the globe, travelers in every inhabited continent journey over land and sea to seek out and experience the treasures of the Philippines. I've been blessed to have traveled so many parts of the world, from Africa to India, learning about places, culture, and people. But my greatest discovery was when I came back and found out that some of the most beautiful treasures in the world are right here in my home, the Philippines. Having grown up away from home, I am finally back, eager to explore my native land and to learn as much as I can about my own people and our beautiful world. I've always been fascinated by stories and pictures of the world-famous hundred islands of the Philippines, but I have to see it with my own eyes to believe that such a fantastic place still exists. My destination? Alamina City, Pangasinan Province, 250 kilometers north of Manila. During the escape from the city, I enjoy the countryside, extensive rice paddies, backdrop by mystical mountains in the distance filling my view, and the hours spent commuting seem more like a joyride towards a waiting legend. A couple hours later, I am greeted by a city bustling with traffic. Busy pedestrians and thriving establishments. Banks, pawn shops, money changers and transfers line the city streets, as do popular fast food chains, clinics, schools, churches and offices. I'm here at last, Alamina City. From the city center, I take a tricycle or motorcycle taxi straight down to the Lucap Wharf, where boats wait at the dock to transport island visitors. Also at Lucap Wharf, I find the Hundred Islands Pension House, where I'm told that budget travelers can book aircon rooms for as little as $6 a night. If you are a group of 8 to 10 people, bigger rooms go for just $20. Of course, I can't wait to eat at the Island Grill restaurant downstairs. But first, it's time to do a bit of shopping. The open sea greets me with its welcoming wind and peaceful calm and the islands themselves, silhouetted against the sky, set the scene for what I know will be the adventure of a lifetime. Wanting to see and experience as much as this day will let me, I book an island day tour for 300 pesos or $6. We seem to glide over the marine park, where the waters glisten like crystals in the sun. The islands and islets aren't far from each other, and as I take in the fresh air, the wind in my face, and the panoramic view of nature, I can't believe I'm actually here. Already, a sort of pride is beginning to take its place in my heart, knowing that these are my islands, and I have sailed the world just to be brought back here to discover them. Only a few of the islands have beach fronts, so island hopping really means steering the boat in and out and around most of them. I think the coralline islets look like mushrooms protruding out of the water. I can already spy the mysterious caves. The next thing you'll see on our island hopping is the island behind me over here. This is known as Heron Island. There's five different species of heron. And if ever you come here, make sure to bring a telescope so you can enjoy the bird watching from here. And a closer view shows me where the herons nest. Bats hang lazily from the trees. Our boatman sounds a horn, which excites the birds and brings them out to view. There's one rocky outcrop here. 
this tiny island has no vegetation on it. But if you look closely, you can see all the terns sunbathing on the top of that rock. I alight first on Governor's Island, where my guide leads me up a staircase that seems to go on forever. Oh, I just climbed a hundred steps up to the top of Governor's Island where they tell me there's a viewpoint that we can see all the islands from. But when I get to the top, I know the climb has been worth it. For there, on the highest point of the islands, I get the best view of them all. Over to my left, you can see where we'll be having scuba diving and snorkeling a bit later, and also the giant clams at the bottom of the ocean over here. On this island, I find a cute guest house which has two bedrooms, a living room, dining room, bath and kitchen. The house comes complete with four drums of water, dining and cooking utensils and equipment, and a generator to run the electric lights and fans. And it's yours for $200 a night. Then I meet the Eco Rescue Diving Team, who offer me an intro to scuba diving. I finally agree to a prep lesson near the shore. Well, going through a quick 15-minute lesson in the shallow waters is a breeze, but jumping off the boat and into the unknown and sinking to the bottom of the ocean in the name of adventure is a different story. A fear of the water and the thought of strange sea creatures has me shaking in my beach shorts at the last minute. Aboard the speedboat, I have time to catch a few breaths and psych myself up. The next stop on this journey takes us under the water to a different world down there. We're going to dive 15 feet underwater. All right, let's do it. <laughs> We're going to do it. Yes. Finally, when I figure there is nothing much to lose but myself to this fantastic experience, I inhale and cut the water. Below, I discover a whole new world that I had no clue ever existed. Suddenly, I am aware and appreciative of the environment that surrounds me. We seem to glide over the jewels of the ocean. What I am witnessing is part of a rehabilitation program at the Hundred Islands National Park to preserve and restore the endangered life of the Tridacnida species of clams. Illegally caught for their tasty meat or for the price of their beautiful shells on the black market. So they are cultured and protected here in Pangasinan. Oh, well, we're back from down below. We went to look at the coral reefs and the giant clams. Those were quite awesome. My diving instructor attempts to take my picture, and forgetting the bulky apparatus I'm strapped to, I smile for the camera and my mask fills with water. Really amazing stuff. Please try it if you come to the Hundred Islands. It's an experience you don't want to miss. Hundred Islands National Park covers a land area of 1,884 hectares. I'm also told that there is an ongoing Adopt an Island program here. Geologists tell us that long ago, this phenomenon began as a mass of coral deposits on the sea floor. Eventually, they grew into layers of limestone. As a result of a drop in sea level, those layers emerged from the sea and were exposed to acidic solutions found in rainwater and groundwater. This exposure caused the limestone to partially erode and dissolve. What was left behind stood as little hills sprouting from the ocean's water level. And those hills, clustered in the Lingayen Gulf, northeast of Alaminos, became known as the Hundred Islands. Now we're approaching Quezon Island. It is the main island, the biggest one. Behind me there are some people already snorkeling in the shallow parts of the water here. This is our third island for the day. We've been to Governor's Island and Quezon Island. 
This one is called Children's Island, and it's called Children's Island because the water goes out quite shallow so the kids can snorkel way out here. The Children's Island comes complete with bungalows that offer screen bedrooms and one drum of fresh water. There are public bathrooms and basic facilities, like kerosene lighting, all for $10 a night. Ideal for a budget traveler. I trek on over towards the Cuenco tunnel-shaped cave. You can already see it from the beachfront. The plan for this one in the future is to have a spa here. If any of the tourists want to get a massage or relax after their tour, this is where they will stop. Right now, we're just going to look inside the cave and see what's here for them. As I walk, I examine with fascination the limestone formations that make up this lonely cove. This cave is very fascinating. It's filled with corals and shells from the beach. And if these walls could talk, they would have lots of stories to tell. Because apparently, during World War II, the Japanese soldiers used this cave as their hideaway. Next, the boat takes me to Shell Island, where I'm told it's the ideal place for kayaking. So I strap on a life vest and head out into the silent waters. Again, the serenity of the Hundred Islands fills me with awe. It seems that time hasn't changed in this place for thousands of years, and that this is the way it was always meant to be. The kayaking was awesome, but I'm still looking for something to feed my adrenaline. And sure enough, I find it. My island hopping takes me next to Marcos Island. Apparently they tried to drill on this island to find fresh water. They haven't been successful yet, I've been told. But there's a cave somewhere. We're gonna get to it. My trek through Marcos Island takes me to Imelda Cave. Surrounding the cave are small bats, actually, and I'm told you can jump from here. One, two, three! After a full day of fun, I'm exhausted and satisfied, and tomorrow I plan to get an early start because there is still Alamino City to see and explore. But first, it's time for dinner at the Island Grill, where full plates of mouth-watering fresh seafood are served for less than $5 a plate. A perfect day ended in a perfect way, on a full stomach with the view of the moon as it rises illuminating these mysterious islands with its peaceful glow. For me, there is nothing better than enjoying the first wink of the sun as it rises over the ocean, spraying the water with crystal colors, painting the skies with its magical light. So on my second day in Alaminos, I ask the fishermen if they'll take me aboard for a tour of the sun-kissed waters before the rest of the city has stirred. In the pre-dawn darkness, all is quiet, serene, and as a breeze whips my face, so does the feeling of complete satisfaction. If only life were always this carefree. Perhaps more significantly than just being a prized tourist destination, the Hundred Islands are home to abundant marine life. The rehabilitation of this national park has made much effort to keep away illegal fishing and pollution which endangers life in these parts. Our guide takes me out on a thin bamboo plank which seems to stretch for miles. Here is one of the mangrove nurseries. We watch for birds in the larger trees and as we do I am instilled with a sense of growing concern for the environment much like the feeling that overtook me as I swam at the bottom of the coral reefs and realized that this was a world worth preserving. After docking back at the wharf, I stroll aimlessly along the coast till I come to what seems to be the day's first bustle. Not exactly the marketplace, but close enough. The fishermen have just brought in their catch for the day here at the Lukap Wharf. We just watched them de-gut and behead this octopus over here.
transportation here besides jeepneys and buses is also these three three-wheeler tricycles. The driver sits here on the side in the motorbike and the passenger seat is attached to the side and you get a nice view of everything around you. And it's really cheap, just a few pesos. My short trike ride ends up at Suki Market near the city center and here is where the real action goes on. After leaving the wharf, the seafood is then brought here to the wet market where it's sold to customers for the day. It's only 6 a.m. and already the market is bustling with activity. journey to discovery takes me down the little streets where old Spanish inspired houses still stand. Children frolic in the playground and street workers walk through the town unhurriedly, shaded by sturdy acacia trees, which have stood as landmarks of the city for hundreds of years. Taha is made of tofu, the soft tofu. He puts sugar inside and jelly balls and mixes it all up. And they usually come around early in the morning. is the national flower of the Philippines. These are some native flowers here. In English, it's probably the closest to jasmine. And these are kamya flowers. You might see it in taxis, on doors, decorating any place. A simple white flower. The city impresses me in a remarkable way, but what I find most amazing is the technology that has been developed in Alamino City. And this is exhibited in the techno demo farms that I find on the outskirts of the city. For travelers interested in the agricultural side of Alaminos, the techno demo farm will demonstrate to us how the government has been implementing new technologies and strategies. So you can see where the water flows yes. in. And as she said, it's not done manually anymore. They have computers to do everything here. The vines you see behind me are actually umpalaya vines. Umpalaya is also known in English as bitter gourd. And if you've tasted the umpalaya, it is quite bitter, but it tastes very nice the way we cook it here in the Philippines with different spices. Sometimes it's mixed into eggs or other vegetables. The focus of my last day here in Alaminos is to find out about those hidden places where the local delicacies like longaniza and binangoy are made. Longaniza is our local sausage, and this is my first time observing the diligent cooks and workers in their assembly line. This is where the process all starts. In this bowl here is where the pork meat is mixed up with different spices, garlic, salt, pepper, coloring, and these are the pork intestines. Now the pork intestines are like the sausage covering. This machine mixes and blends everything together and compresses the meat to fit into the intestine around the skin. I'm learning how to measure three fingers. Mine don't look so good yet. They're a bit ugly, but she said it's okay for beginners. I also get the rare chance to witness binangay in the making. It is a three-hour process of cooking the sweet sticky rice over an open fire in hollow bamboo poles. After a day's worth of city scouting, you bet I'm ready for a feast. And for lovers of fine dining, the place to go for this experience is Maxine's by the Sea. 
blazing torches line the dock where we feast on the most delicious spread ever. Freshly grilled lobster, plump calamares, steamed crab, deep fried catfish, and delicious red wine. And as I get my fill of these island delights, savoring my last night in this paradise, I recall Alamino City, both with its underwater worlds and thriving agricultural development on land. It seems one of the rarest treasures in the Philippines. My visit to the Hundred Islands was like a time travel to paradise. Here was where nature lay untouched, where mystical legends left a magical trail, where each sunset was more spectacular than the night before, and each sunrise a welcome to a new beginning. I knew that answering the call of the Philippines to come back home had infused in my heart a sense of heritage so strong that indeed, I would return to these islands a hundred times over. Gamgamunan kuna ka boy kausunan pa 